uh, Carrie Ann um, and last name Hibbard, right? Am I correct? That one right too. Yes, you are. Cool. So it, it's funny that um, it, it's quite possible that a lot of other people who listen to this, like me, um, know your name and have known it for a while too, but uh, might not have met you face to face because we see your name around on stuff because you do stuff with uh is it is it you're you're the let's see you're the uh are you the general band manager yes for wasatchin district so and and so as such you end up posting on the utah bagpipers facebook group quite a bit um i feel like i've seen your name on emails and stuff too have you ever done anything with the the branch or the or with wasbaba or is it just totally out of your role with the with the giant the biggest band in the in the in the area that makes it so i see your name around I was helping with Wasba for a little bit. I was their, I don't know what the name was, publications chair or press secretary. Or it was, I was helping with uh, sending emails out to all members for a few months. And then uh, the pandemic happened. And then I got sort of overwhelmed with a lot of stuff. And so I dropped that and just kept doing the general manager for Wasatch. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, understandable. And that makes sense why I would have seen your name around so much. That's why I was so excited to talk because I don't know, do you, I, I mean, I'd imagine we probably have seen each other physically at like various Scottish festivals and stuff, but like, I don't know if we've ever talked face to face. I don't think we've ever talked face to face, but I definitely know that I've seen you at both Payson and Salt Lake. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nice. Perfect. And that's probably because I had something embarrassing happening with my kilt. That's probably why you, you know for sure that you saw me. That's wonderful. Well. I don't think it was that. <laughs> I know in Salt Lake, uh, there was one time when Wasatch, so our grade two group, was standing standing next to Garden Valley. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I don't remember what was happening that made me like take notice of the whole band. And then I was like, oh. Hey, it's Garden Valley. I don't know very many of these people. Yeah. Oh, I think I bet I can remember. I think that was probably the time when um so like Garden Valley, we probably had like I don't know, maybe 15 total participating members at the time between pipers and drummers. And all of Wasatch there, you know, was more than 15. And so when we were lining up for the uh for the mass bands, you know, there was basically a column for each band, but a lot of Wasatch had to kind of Fill Going in. to the other group. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. I turned around and saw that suddenly our band looked like it was three times as big. So I just went ahead and made the announcement that all Wasatch and District members who were in our line were now members of our band. I think that's what it was. <laughs> and I think that some people maybe didn't love that announcement, but that's okay. No, that's a fun announcement. Honorary members anyway. <laughs> I, I like the uh, the fun and teasing aspect that comes with the good relationships between bands. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you there entirely. And, and yeah. speaking of which, uh, Carrie Ann, I am I want to know like I want to I want you to be able to talk freely about anything, of course. But I kind of want to just to get us sort of oriented to start us out. Where did you come from? You know, and I'm talking like even pre-bagpipes. Where'd you grow up and stuff? And along that story, at what point did you encounter bagpipes for the first time? And then along that story, who taught you how to play? And when did you start playing with Wasatch and District? And, and just kind of tell me your story. All right. So I'm going to monologue you for a minute. Yeah, monologue me. Like like an uh, evil villain. Go for it. <laughs> so born in California, my dad was in the Navy and he was stationed near San Diego at the time. Just before my first birthday, he got new orders and was transferred to the Holy Lock Naval Base in Sandbank, Scotland. So it's Sandbank near to noon. Technically, I think it's Argyllshire. Um, so we were there for about three years. And then they were shutting down the base and he was just about ready to retire from the Navy. So we moved back to the States. I have hardly any memories from Scotland. I remember it being very rainy and I remember it being very green. But when we got back to the States, uh, my sister, my older sister, she's four years older than me. She was the only person who could understand me because I, you know, I lived in California for the first year of my life. And then I lived in Scotland and was between a, an American military base where you mostly get American accents, like American spoken English but then also our activities off base where I picked up a, a good portion of the Scottish accent. So it was uh, some kind of, was it like a Scotch Valley girl situation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a little bit like that. And I, I just remember like being 
in the van, right, with my mom driving, and I would say something, and she'd go, what? And so I'd say it louder and probably a little bit faster. And she'd go, what? So I'd say it louder. And she'd go, <laughs> what? So I'd scream it. And she'd go, Jesse, what is she saying? <laughs> uh, so as soon as my mom could, she put me in speech therapy, and that helped to fix quite a bit of the accent. A big part of it was my R's because they say R's very differently in Scotland yeah. than we do here. And so that that had to get be fixed. But uh, my mom would take us. I, I, I don't mean, I don't mean to interrupt. I just it's funny to me that like I have a kid who I, we've had in speech therapy precisely to help him with his R's as well. But I've never I've never thought of anybody having to go to speech therapy to like remove the Scottish accent. Like accent. This, this is a problem. We got to get the Scotch out of this girl. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's and it's funny because now if people ask me to speak in a Scottish accent, I can't. I can't yeah. do it. If can't I fake, yeah. No, if I listen to um the Scottish accent for a long time. Like, did you watch Doctor Who? I've seen some episodes. Honestly, not, I watched a lot of the Doctor Who, whatever, whichever iteration was running in the late 90s. That's where I saw That's most of watched. my Doctor Who. So I don't, I don't remember the name of actors and actresses, but whoever played Amy on Doctor Who, I watched a bunch of interviews with her. And shortly after that, I was talking to a friend and a Scottish accent just slipped out. <laughs> <laughs> it just came back, huh? <laughs> yep. So little, little things like that. Sometimes it'll come back. Um, but when we were back in Utah, my mom took us to the Scottish festival every year for a while. We were living with my grandma in Murray and the Scottish festival was at Murray park. So we'd head over there and we had bagpipe CDs that I would listen to growing up. So I was very familiar with the sound of the bagpipe. I knew that I really liked it. And then in high school, this is going to be really embarrassing, but I'm 100% putting it out there. It's a safe space. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but until people listen to it. <laughs> in <laughs> high school, the, so I, I went to Union uh, – okay, I went to Parkside Elementary in Murray School District for third through sixth grade. Mm. And then we moved, and I went to Union Middle School in Midvale for seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And then we moved again, and so I was back in Murray School District for my high school years. So there is one girl who I remembered really well. I'm going to leave names out of this, but you one girl who I remembered. Innocent. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> one girl who I remembered really well. And uh, she was th the one person that I became friends with. I didn't really have any other friends at the school. And she happened to have a big crush on Trevor DeMoss, who we know is the pipe major of Salt Lake Scott. Yeah, now. who can blame her? Right. Seriously. <laughs> so like in high school, oh man, she called him Legolas a lot. She thought he, oh. he looked like a younger Orlando Bloom. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, so she, she, she loved being this in the same places that he was. And then she had another friend who uh, had a crush on Tyler Abeda. I don't know if you know Tyler. He played with the Salt Lake Scots when he was younger. Uh, he's not playing right now. Trevor and I have both been trying to get him to come back to the Salt Lake Scots for a while. So uh, this is my plug to get Tyler to pick up his bagpipes. Uh, yeah, but... I don't know if I met that, Tyler, but I also think he should come back. Exactly. <laughs> so because these two friends had, like, huge crushes on these boys, we were everywhere, everywhere that they were when they were playing. So if they did a – like an assembly at school, we would definitely be there. If there was yeah. a talent show, we would definitely be there. If we heard of performances they were doing, we would definitely be there. Did you they make went... like fangirl t-shirts or anything like that? We did not, not quite take that it far, that huh? far, but huh. we totally should have. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we did have a name for them. They were the Fab Five. Nice. Uh, because it was, it was Trevor, Tyler, Thomas Heseltine, who played with Utah Pipe Band for a while, Ben Ferner, who also played with Salt Lake Scots for a while. Also, his dad was my seminary teacher in ninth grade, which was so funny. One of the best dudes I've ever met in my life. Um, and then Dan DeMoss, who did not play bagpipes, but hung out with them all the time. So you, we called know, him the Fab Five. It, it also, it's funny. It's it's totally fine. It's just funny that it just occurred to me that, like, we, we will protect the innocent, but not, not these handsome men. Let's go ahead and get it all <laughs> out there. <laughs> Anybody wants to do some Facebook stocking or maybe start making go some... Go for it. <laughs> let's make some young Legolas t-shirts and wear them to the next Scottish festival. <laughs> oh, man. If if this goes out and Trevor sees this, he might just murder me. <laughs> but, you know, people just know that he was an attractive teenager. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so... Those five. We also had Nick. I don't remember what nicknames were for everyone. I just know that Trevor's was Scott because, like, 
Scotland. Scotland, got you. Right. Like, as a, you know, 14-year-old girl, what else are you, uh, I guess 15, what else are you going to do? Getting creative. Right. So we'd go to these places, watch them play, and Heather would sit there and she'd be like, oh, doesn't he look so good in his kilt? Look at his hair. Look at those <laughs> muscles in his arms. Look at his legs. And I'd be like, Heather, stop. I'd, I'd really like to just listen to the bagpipes right now. Oh, you were there for the music, not for I, the not for the D-throw forearm muscles, huh? Right. So once I really realized how much I loved the music aspect of it, um, I started paying more attention to that. I had a class with Trevor, and I started asking him questions, little things like, uh, what's the fastest tune you can play? How do you get the chanter to stop? And then start again. Mm. And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, you play this tune. And I hummed it for him. And he goes, oh, that's not the chanter stopping. You just play a high A. I was like, oh, that's a note mm. that's being played. Okay. So I picked up little things along the way. And then I finally got up the courage. And I had another different class with Tyler. And so I asked him where he learned to play the bagpipes. And he took lessons with Dennis McMaster at the Celtic Center. Mm. So... I called the Celtic Center. I found out how much lessons would cost, what they recommend for a beginner, got all the information. I took it to my mom and I said, mom, I want to take bagpipe lessons. And at this point, I had already tried and quit the piano, the viola, the violin, the clarinet, and the flute. <laughs> and so like, One more in a long line. <laughs> right. And she was like, I'm not going to put up with you learning the bagpipe. Yeah, she'd and then suffered quitting. through the violin and the flute already. Come on. <laughs> right. So I begged her every single day for three months. And then she finally caved, but only if she was allowed to take lessons with me. Oh, cool. And I was like, okay, done deal. Let's do it. So we set up a lesson. And in that first lesson, she learned that her pinky finger on her bottom hand, so her right hand, was just a little bit too small to reach over. Oh, no. Is it to be able like, to cover like the hole. Dangling off the edge of the chanter, not quite reaching. <laughs> right. I think she probably, like, you know, now that I'm teaching, she probably could have angled her hand yeah, and made it work. Yeah, kind of Yeah. Right. But it wasn't something that she was interested in doing after that. So she let me keep going with lessons. Um, I practiced so much. I had never loved learning an instrument so much. Part of what really worked for me is Dennis teaches a modified version of Cantoric. Oh, um, awesome. So you learned you, that? Yes. Yeah, so like for me, the scale is instead of like low G, low A, B, C, D, I, I go M, N, O, L, A, E, A, I, A. And like Scotland the Brave is Egan, onto Yen, O, Gado, Yen, Gado, E, A, I, I, A, Group 2, A, E, Gado, Yen. That and is that, so cool. I love it. it I want to learn that, Carrie Ann. That's awesome. All right. I should definitely teach you. It's, it's my, it's honestly my favorite. And I teach my students because it helped me. It still helps me to memorize music easier. I automatically sing it before I play it. Like you'll hear instructors tell you, sing the music, then play it because oh, yeah, you want to yeah. play it the way you would sing it. Yeah, I've heard Stuart Little and others say that that's before they pick up a chanter, they sing a tune. Yep, and that's that's how I learned to do it. Dennis would force me to sing it before I played it. Like if I if I had learned it and I could play it, I'd walk in there and I'd put my chanter to my lips and he'd go, no, sing it first. Ah, that's awesome. <sighs> okay. Um, yep, so I, I loved that. It took me it was probably only about six months before I was up on the pipes, uh, maybe another six months before I joined the grade four band in the Salt Lake Scots. Um, that was fun because then I was in – a band with Trevor and Tyler <laughs> and Ben. And it was so awkward. Like, like to be clear, you were there for the music, but yeah. two boys was a, a decent bonus, right? Well, but for me, I, I wasn't the one that ever had that crush on them. And I, I'm not the kind of person that I'm, I don't have that stock, that stalker mentality. <laughs> so I went along with it because that's what my friends were doing. And they were the only people I knew at the school. So now that I'm like there and I'm playing the pipes and I'm so excited to be there, I'd see them at rehearsal. And it was just so awkward. And I don't know if they knew how much we paid attention to them in high yeah. school. <laughs> like they would <laughs> – at Murray High, there was this uh, – like balcony that you could look down at, but like to see the lunchroom. And the balcony was directly over this long hallway that people would walk down to go outside to their cars and leave for lunch. And we would start our lunch period on that balcony, watching them leave to go wherever they were going. Oh, wow. And then we'd go do our <laughs> thing. And then we would end our lunch period on that balcony so they could watch 
these boys come back from lunch. Like, oh, these high schools, high school girls. It's cute. It's sweet. It's, but uh... so awkward. <laughs> a bit awkward <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway but still I was I was grateful to be in the band um one of those girls who who had a crush on one of those guys uh joined the band eventually as a tenor drummer uh, I, I, she didn't I was gonna guess but I didn't want to seem like I was being like disparaging of either her or tenor drummers in general but go but carry on <laughs> no yep she <laughs> she joined as a tenor drummer I think she only played with them for a year before she quit um, but I was, I was with Alex Scott's for a while. I got into my second year of college and got super involved with some student organizations in college and I, I quit the band and there were, there were a couple of reasons there. Um, at that point, Dennis was no longer pipe major. He chopped off two and a half of his fingers Ooh. during, uh, when he was making or repairing a bagpipe. And so he had switched to bass drum and That's that pipe major position had moved to someone there. else. Yeah, wow. Right, especially as a piper, like that's yeah. terrifying. Um, I, I've I've told my wife before, like, and I I don't mean in any way to be insensitive to people who have uh, you know challenges with mobility, but like honestly, if I had to choose, like, between like in, an an inability to walk, you know, being in a wheelchair, for example, and and losing my my fingers or ability to play for things like the bagpipes, I'm it would be a hard decision to to say the least. At least, you know, I'm not I'm not sure exactly which I would choose, but yeah, I I live in terror of losing the mobility of my fingers or my fingers themselves. I think we all feel that way, like especially if you know, like when we play every day, it's more than just a light hobby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely feel the same way. So he was no longer pipe major. There oh, but new... where? Uh, sorry, Carrie, and I wanted to know where you went to school. Where were you going to college? University of Utah. Cool. Um, and Trevor was also up there. So was Aaron Wilson, who played with Salt Lake Scots for a while, and. Danny, I cannot think of his last name at the moment, and that makes me so sad. It wasn't um, Caldwell, was it? I don't think it was Caldwell, I'm not, no. I'm not sure where he went to college, actually. But Well, surely there are multiple Dannys who play pipes, surely. Right. I mean, I know, too, just in our band, so <laughs> there are lots of Dannys out there. So he, we, the group of us, formed like a Utah, I don't remember what we called ourselves. We, we formed a University of Utah pipe group where we were teaching some people to play pipes and we would perform it. Like we, I remember performing at a basketball game one time. So that was really cool. But uh, it got to the point that the pipe band was a chore. Mm. It wasn't fun anymore. And it, it wasn't something I was interested in spending time on when I was trying to get through college. So yeah, I turned in my pipes at that point I was renting from the band. So I turned in my pipes, turned in my uniform um, and, and just stopped for a while and I wanted to keep going. It just, it wasn't the time for me to do it. And honestly, the, at, at that time, the group that was the Salt Lake Scots, it wasn't the right group for me either. Mm -hmm. So I moved down to Arizona in 2010. My dad, my bonus mom, my little sister and her mom all lived down there. And for <laughs> almost her whole life, my little sister and I had such a close relationship and I was very much her confidant. Should, and... should, I, should I pry or not pry about the term bonus mom? Should I just leave that or should I ask no, you No, you can about totally it? pry. What, what's so, a bonus mom? I don't, I don't have one of those. Do I get one of those? She's my stepmom. Um, but growing up, she hated the term stepmom because there's such got a... connotations. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know where she heard the term bonus mom at one point, but she loved that and because it meant so much to her and was so important to her i adopted the use of that um and like there's been times when we haven't gotten along well and times where we get along great you know like and, any and when I you think. don't get along well is that when you say stepmother honestly maybe sometimes <laughs> <laughs> uh but i definitely try to use the term bonus mom because i know how important it is for her and i love and respect her well that's nice i can see why that would make a difference yeah thanks so Little sister was struggling. She was in ninth grade at the time. And we had talked about, like, when I was, she's she's eight years younger than me. And we had talked about, well, when she was in high school, then I would be out of college and I would be 
settled and I'd have my own house and she could come and live with me and I would take care of her. And then I am, got am into I college. Am I wrong to guess that that, that did, is not quite how things played out? <laughs> yeah, that's not <laughs> how it worked. <laughs> and I learned that while I was in college, like, mm -hmm. oh, I can't take care of a kid. Yeah. I, I can't buy a house. <laughs> so instead, I picked up my life and I moved down to Arizona, uh, got a job down there and... I, I ended up living with my dad um, and family for a little bit. Was but this uh, Flagstaffy or Mesa E? Mesa E. So it was Chandler, Mesa, and Tempe, gotcha. right in that area. And before I even moved down there, I had looked up the pipe bands in the area, mm -hmm. and I knew that I wanted to play with the Mesa Caledonian pipe band. So I moved down in August. I didn't reach out to them at all. I think I was just getting settled that first year. Mm -hmm. And then the following... I think it's February that they have their their Scottish Highland Games. Um, I went I went to the games. I looked for someone in a Mesa kilt. I found a gal named Lois, talked to her a little bit, and I told her, I really want to come play with you all, but I don't have a set of bagpipes. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's fine. We have some extra sets from the band. We can loan you one. Here's our information for rehearsal. We will see you on Friday. That's awesome. That's okay. that's the kind of beautiful experience that like every member of every pipe band hopes to have that like someone out of the blue will walk up and say, I am proficient at playing this instrument and I would like to join your group. <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. Seriously though, that's exactly what we hope for. And that's what I did. <laughs> so played with them. Um, they were a great group to play with. They, they weren't super competitive. Um, I think we probably took last in more competitions than anything else someone's got to do it someone's exactly do <laughs> but it was a really fun group so when i first joined them they had a grade four and a grade three i started in the grade four um went up to their grade three pretty quickly i took lessons with uh their pipe major chris and then also another member of the band chuck while i was down there um uh, chris was a very positive instructor chuck was one of those instructors that yells at you until you get it right. <laughs> and it was honestly... Different strokes, right? Different yeah. Strokes. <laughs> it was helpful to have both of them. Yeah. I remember... There's a place the, for both. The biggest thing that, that Chuck helped me with, one of them was telling me to hold the high A, <laughs> which I'll <laughs> never forget. But then also, I was really struggling with my burls at one point. And he goes, well, that's because you're not playing 100 burls a day. You have to play 100 burls every single day. And... Every day since then, I have played 100 burls, and really? I play great burls now. Hey, so so your burl style, is it like double tap? Is it swipe down, swipe up? Or is it like that figure seven turn sideways where you swipe down and then kind of pull your pinky into your hand? Okay. I know I do the swipe down, swipe up, but it's mm. I think it's the seven where I pull my pinky into my hand afterwards. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, it's the figure seven. That's how that's how I burl as well. Not saying it's superior, but you know, just everybody has kind of a slightly different way to burl. So I'm always curious. Right when uh, when I teach students how to burl, I make them learn all of the methods. So the double tap, the tap and swipe, uh, the swipe down, swipe up, the seven, and then the swipe up, swipe down. Oh, whoa! I've never is, even thought of even trying that. That was one that Chuck taught a different student in my band. Uh, down in Mesa that really worked for her and her brother. So that's one that, that I keep in mind and try to teach people now. So I'll, I'll teach all of them to my students. And then we go through a three week period where they have to spend a certain amount of time trying all of them. And then they pick the one that works the best for them. Wow. That is so interesting. I, I mean, it's so simple. I should, you know, it's like, well, why didn't I ever think of that? You just go the other direction, but that's also interesting that you have them like really dig into each one to find what works best for them. Cause I, like with my students, I usually just say, in one lesson, I'm just like, here are a few ways to do it. Which one feels good? Oh, okay, that one, do that one. And, you know, I never much, give much more time to it. I can see that it would, be, it would be valuable to give them a little more time to, like, really feel things out because sometimes something works at one speed and then doesn't at and another speed. Right. Hmm. Yeah. So Mesa Caledonian in Arizona, um, again, they were a great group. I, I love the family atmosphere of that group. I have friendships and relationships with people down there that I'll have forever. Um, it was very hard for me to leave that group, uh, but I knew that I was only planning on spending four to five years in Arizona. It ended up being five years and then coming back up to Utah. So the whole time I was down there, I was thinking about what group I would want to play with when I moved back up to Utah. Uh, the reasons that I left the Salt Lake Scots 
still existed when I moved back up to Utah. And because of that, I wasn't willing to go back to the Salt Lake Scott at that time. I love, I love the band. It just wasn't the right band for me. Oh, yeah. And I had followed Wasatch since they went to Worlds in mm -hmm. Scotland. That was probably when I first started paying attention to them. And it helped that my pipe major in Arizona, Chris, was very good friends with Andrew Morrill. So we went to, <laughs> this was interesting, we went to um, a Highland Games at one point. I don't remember which one it was, but Wasatch was there. So Was uh, it in, Chris, in Utah or outside of no, Utah? No, I think it was in California. Gotcha. Uh, Chris walked me over to their tent, and I talked a bit with Andrew Morrill and Justin Howland um, and let them know that I'd be moving up the next year, and I was very interested in joining their group. And so Justin talked to me about their audition process, let me know that they had a grade two and a grade four, um, and depending on how things went, would kind of depend on which, which group I started with. And then at the next games in California that our group went to, the Salt Lake Scots were there. <laughs> and two members of the Salt Lake Scots who I had not talked to or heard from in probably five years saw me, came up to me, talked to me, and were like, oh, yeah, we heard you're moving to Utah. <laughs> yeah, can't wait to have you yeah. back, right? Like, we're keeping your pipes warm for you. <laughs> right. So they, oh. they, they were not explicit about like, hey, <laughs> we'd really like you to come back and play with us. But it was definitely like a, 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 a sort of a recruitment attempt without like actually making it a recruitment attempt sure it, but and like who wouldn't who wouldn't right like right we've had I members totally move out of state and like if they moved back to utah i would like without even like implicit if i wasn't very careful to be conscious about it i would just assume they were going to come back and play with us you know right yep and so i was honestly like i was flattered by them even coming and talking to me it made yeah. me feel like okay i'm i'm wanted um and that that made me feel good so i moved back up to utah in June or July 2015 and started attending rehearsals for Wasatch and District in I think September or October I think it was I think it was October um you, I had sent them go ahead I, I was just curious do you happen to remember off the top of your head what year it was that Wasatch and District formed as a band 2004 okay okay and, and you say it was 2015 that you moved back up to Utah yeah okay so yep. they were they were pretty well established for sure Oh, yeah. They were very well established. Um, I sent in an audition video while I was still living in Arizona, like shortly before I made the move up to Utah. Yeah. And Justin listened to it and he said, all right, so you, you've got the fingers. You could do great in the grade two band. You've got some blowing issues. And he was totally right. I told him like, oh, that's because I recorded this at the end of a two hour rehearsal, which I did. But it was because I spent two hours trying to get the perfect recording. Mm, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, I, I think anybody who's ever tried to record themselves has had that experience. Like, oh, I'll just do a quick recording. Right. Five minutes, you know, <laughs> two hours later. Please, right. please be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, oh, hey, wait, it's just so nerve wracking. Did, did Justin mention your excellent burls? He did not. What? How I know. Gosh. It's just so insulting. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, it, so good fingers. You could do it in grade two. You've got some blowing issues. So that was in maybe May or June. And then I, I didn't play again until I started going out to rehearsal with them in October. Mm -hmm. And by then my blowing issues were way worse. And I had gone <laughs> from sea level to 4,000 feet uh, of elevation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... I was attending the grade two rehearsals, but I hadn't been on pipes. Um, and I decided that I wanted to take some time before I jumped right back into the band scene. So I took the year off. And over that next year, I ended up having some vision issues. Like I woke up one day and my right eye was super blurry and it didn't go away for a long time. Went mm. to the doctor and they didn't know what it was. And I thought I was losing my vision in my right eye. Turns out they still don't know what it is. And I still get weird blurred vision for 12-ish weeks every winter. It'll just hit. Really? It lasts about 12 weeks and then it fades away. And then it hits again and they have no idea what, what's causing it. So hey, I'm, someday... I'm no medical doctor, but do, I, I'd imagine you probably have. But have you explored the possibility of recurring migraine possibly causing it? I just I only think of that because my wife and her brother both get this weird blurry vision thing without an associated headache 
And the best answer they've found so far is that it's a manifestation of migraine that just doesn't come with a painful headache. So I've thought about that. And the only reason I've ruled that out is because it only happens in the winter. Yeah, that is seasonal. Mm. And it seems to happen somewhere between December and January every year. It's happened in the spring one time. Um, I I don't mean to turn this into the the podcast about (laughs) medical issues or anything. I was just curious, like, and and does it happen just here in Utah? Like, have you ever been out of state, like at sea level or something like that? Like, could it be the dry air or something like that having an effect? That's one of the things I've wondered also, because it did not happen when I was living in Arizona. It happened my first winter in Utah when Mm. I moved back up. And I've, it, I've had one time where like I was experienced, I was in the middle of the blurred vision and I went down to Arizona and it felt like it cleared up faster, hmm. but like you need a pattern to really sure, know. Yeah. So personally, I think it might have something to do with either uh, the elevation or dry air or those stupid inversions we get every oh, winter. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> so, Suddenly living in a smog cloud. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I took some extra time because I was investigating that and honestly terrified at the time. At this point, I have to blame you. Right. I've accepted that maybe someday I'll lose vision in my right eye and it's not a big deal anymore. I, my left eye is great. It has perfect vision. So if I've got to rely on that, I'm good. But I've also got these like weirdly enlarged blind spots. Mm -hmm. So I stand right next to my pipe major in the circle and Mm -hmm. I have to like put my head in the right position in order to see his foot tap or my blind spot blocks his foot. Does that make, does that make for like some difficulties with like uh, muscles tightening up when you play for too long, stuff like that? Like in your neck or something, you know? So I hadn't thought about that before, but I'm definitely, I've talked to other people who have this issue also. Um, if when I'm playing, if I play for more than probably 30 to 45 minutes, or if I play for more than five minutes straight, then when I stop playing, I get a huge headache like Mm. right away. And then it fades away very quickly. And the longer I play, the longer it takes for it to fade away. But Mm. if I take like a no dose pill, like a caffeine pill or Excedrin migraine, or I, drink some caffeine before I start playing, then it's fine. Interesting. So, so is the is the angle that you have to hold your head at such that like you have to, like if you're playing by yourself, oh, it's not a big saying. deal. But then like when you have to, when you go play with the band and you're next to the pipe major, do you have to like readjust your blowpipe and stuff? Is it that big of a change or can you just kind of turn your head and join the group and then I go back just, to playing by yourself? Yeah, I can just turn my head and join the group. And gotcha. it's not that I have, there, there's only one head position that will work. Oh, I there's see. many that will work. There's just a few, oh, a few that, that don't work. Won't. <laughs> yeah, see, and I so see. it's it's super interesting when I figure out the one that doesn't work. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, look at his. Oh shoot, I can't see his foot. <laughs> okay, turn. <laughs> huh. Yep. Um. Anyway, so took that first year off, and then I think I don't remember if it was Justin Howland or Mark Piconin who sent me an email in September 2016 and said. Hey, Carrie Ann, we just wanted to get back in touch with you to see if you were interested in coming out to play with us. And I got that email and I was like, man, no, I'm not interested in coming yet. I want more time. I am enjoying the time I have that I don't have to devote to a pipe band. Yeah. But you emailed me and I feel obligated and dang it, I'm going to come to practice. <laughs> So I started in the grade four group because I just wasn't willing to devote the amount of time that grade mm-hmm. two would require. Yeah. Um, and that first year, I did not practice at home at all. Like just, I learned. Just the band practice, huh? Yep, just band practice. I learned the music on my practice channel, showed up at band practice, played it on my pipes. And to be honest, I was good enough at the time that yeah. for the grade yeah. four group, I didn't really need to practice too much at home on my own. You know, sometimes I feel like that's exactly not to be demeaning to people who are learning, you know, who are coming up through grade five and grade four. But sometimes I feel like that is part of why any organization might want to prioritize keeping a grade five or a grade four group. Um, just because for some folks, it's um, it's a question of level of time commitment that like either they can't or would rather not give as much time as is going to be required to play with a higher level group, but they'd love to still play some. And so if you have a, a home for those people in grade four, or grade five, it's not a bad thing. Right. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where it was for me that first year. And then we went to Enumclaw 
for a competition. It was my first traveling competition with Wasatch, my first traveling competition in a couple years. And boy, did that light a fire under my bum. <laughs> yeah, that makes not sense. I'm not going to swear yeah. on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, save me some work in post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it was. I don't, I mean, SFU was there. Triumph oh, Street was there. Okay, yeah. There, you got plenty of reasons to have that, that old bum fire lit. That makes right. Sense. <laughs> <laughs> like seeing those bands. Uh, it was it was one of the best games I had ever been to. And so on day two of those games, I, I went and talked to Andrew Morrill. And I was like, Andrew, I want to take lessons again. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I, need to, I need to start doing this again. And I want to learn Peabrook. And up until that point, oh, I hated Peabrook. I had refused to learn it. It's so and then boring. maybe That's what I thought. It was like, who wants to play that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two years before that, I heard someone competing with a Peabrook. And it got stuck in my head. Oh, really? I think it was Ronald McDonald of Morar. Um, and I don't know if I pronounced that right. Uh, but it got stuck in my head. And then I started listening to a little bit of Peabrook and decided that I actually secretly really liked it. So talk talked to Andrew Morrill and he said, well, if you want to learn Peabrook, you should take lessons with Ross. I'm like, okay. So then I went and talked to Ross and started taking lessons with him. And if I'm being 100% honest, I had an ulterior motive. I was secretly grateful to be taking lessons with Ross at that point because I learned that Justin Howland was um, going to be stepping back as pipe major and Ross would be pipe major instead because Justin was moving um, at the end of that year. Mm, you, so, you, were, you, were, you were planning and making designs, I see. Yeah, I had decided that I wanted to play with the grade two pipe band uh, and I needed – the pipe major of the grade two pipe band to take notice of me and to recognize my talent and my skills. Mm -hmm. And I figured they could do that in one-on-one lessons. Right. So I think initially before I talked to Andrew, I had talked to Justin and that's when he told me that he was actually moving soon. So he probably wasn't the best person. Then I talked to Andrew and then Andrew recommended Ross. I see. So it worked out really well because I joined the grade two band the next year. (laughs) Um, But I, Ross is, he's, honestly one of the best instructors I've had. Um, Most instructors, I would be very nervous when I would have to pick up my pipes and play in front of them. Like I'd be more nervous for them than I am playing for a judge. And I've told Ross before that one of my issues with him as an instructor is that I'm not nervous to play for him. So then I get in front of a judge and I am nervous. (laughs) Uh, So that's, that's been fun, but he's, he's helped me so much and I'm very grateful to be taking lessons from him. And he's, an incredible Peabrook instructor. And I love playing Peabrook more than light music now. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah, you know, I, I joke about it being boring, which, okay, like, let's be honest. If you don't love it, it is, you know. But, like, it was very boring for me until what, what changed it for me was I, I found a, a video that I've been trying to find so I could call it out. It's somewhere on YouTube of a guy playing a Peabrook. I can't remember which one, with, like, a string quartet backing him up. And that kind of opened my brain to like, oh, there's like musical movement happening here. It's not just, oh, I found it. It's Lord Lovett's Lament. Well, that makes sense. Of course, that's a very popular one. That is a very popular one. Um, it's from the Big Music Society featuring Murray Henderson. Um, oh, he's great. Yeah. So he played it with like some strings and uh, maybe some brass in there too. I don't, I don't remember. I remember there were at least some violins and a bass. Um, and uh, yeah, it was beautiful. But but when you when you started playing Peabrook, did you learn more Cantrock to sing it? Or did you apply what you that modified version you'd already you'd already learned? Yeah, I basically applied the modified version I've learned. I still need to look up the Cantoric for the Peabrook movements. Right, right. Because I Dennis didn't teach Peabrook at all, and so he didn't, you didn't know, have words for those. Yeah, like yeah. his his modified version of it. So I've just kind of made it up. But at some point, I need to learn the proper names for things like. Uh, a, a grip, I just say grip to. A tarlua, mm. I just say onto. And I believe a grip, you put a dr in front of it. So if I'm doing a grip to B, I would say dro. Mm. Uh, and I think a tarlua is karen, k like like Karen. Mm. So if I was doing a tarlua to A for, well, if I'm doing a tarlua to A, it'd be karen. If I'm doing a tarlua to B, it'd be Caro to see it be Carao, I think, but I need to look that up for sure. Well, you know, at least the things that you were, your, your sort of made up stand in terms either make sense or sound legitimate. I think that if I was making up my own, it'd be something like 
delight, diddle do, diddle dee, <laughs> you know. It would right, be. I think that's what most people do. <laughs> uh, bubbly, bubbly, bubbly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I love it. So, yeah, Wasatch, Wasatch has been great. Um, I play harmonies in the band now, which is really fun. I love harmonies. Oh, yeah, I'm with you there. Uh, became, okay, that whole general manager thing, yeah, that what, was. What's with that? What's with that? So I I had some ideas for development for the band, getting some grants to to pay for some things. Um, and Liesl Shoup and I had a conversation driving to the airport in Alma, Michigan, when we were there for a games, where I told her all these ideas I had for development. So then Liesl, who was on the executive committee for Wasatch, went and talked to the executive director, Daniel Schneider. I don't know what the conversation was, but I imagine it went something like, Hey, Dano, Carrie Ann and I were in a car together and she has some really good good ideas for development. I want her to get us money. So we should put her on the executive committee and tell her to go get us money. <laughs> right. And like yeah. instead of let's take her ideas and do the work for them, let's make her do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Something <laughs> like that. Do it? <laughs> and and then Dano was like, hey, great idea. I'll talk to her at rehearsal. So then we go to rehearsal and he talks to me and he was like, hey, so we don't actually have a position for development on the executive committee, but we do have a position for executive secretary and it's open. So you could be the executive secretary and then you could also do development. Huh? <laughs> I was like, uh, like, wink, wink, lucky you. Right. Aren't you excited? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what it was. Um, and I really wanted to do development. I did not want to do executive secretary, but yeah. I really wanted to do development. So I was like, okay, if that's what it's going to take for you guys to let me do development for the band, then fine, I'll do it. So then I became executive secretary and I learned that there was a huge issue in Wasatch with communication, like a big lack of communication going mm. out to band members. So I took it upon myself to fix that. And I started sending out emails for updates and information about uh, performances. I wasn't the general manager. Russ Parker was, and he did a phenomenal job. I would send reminders out or I don't, I honestly don't know what else. I was really quick to respond to emails if people would have questions. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of became this de facto like, oh yeah, Carrie Ann has the answers. Ask Carrie Ann. Um, <laughs> I do you ever do you ever regret making the decisions that brought you to this to this place, Carrie Ann? <laughs> so much, <laughs> so much. I love what I do. Don't get me wrong, I love it, but there's so much work involved with it. So, yeah. I I ended up having to attend the executive committee meetings, which was like an hour and a half uh, every month. And then also the board meetings, even though I was not on the board, because as the executive secretary, I had to take minutes for the board meetings. Mm -hmm. And those meetings were like two hours following the executive committee meeting every other month. So, so you quit your job, right? And just oh this became gosh. your full-time gig, right? <laughs> it was it was so – so at least with the executive secretary stuff, most of it I could do in the evenings. Um, and the meetings weren't terribly cumbersome, but – Every other month when we would have like three and a half hours of meetings on a Wednesday, those were terrible. That's I when you hate started questioning, meetings. questioning your decisions. Yeah. So I did that for about a year, I think. And then Russ Parker let us know that he wanted to step back as general manager because he wanted to step back into the pipe core for grade four. And he didn't have time for both. So he stepped away. We had this big reshuffling of responsibilities. And in the end... I was the general manager still doing development, but it meant I didn't have to take notes at meetings. I did not have to attend the board meetings and I, I lost some additional responsibilities with executive secretary. So great, solid. I'll do that. But I had no idea what I was doing as general manager. Mm. So it took some time for me to figure out what that meant, how to go out and get gigs, how to negotiate for pay. I'm still learning so much. Um, but my yeah, when, are, when are you going to write a book? Because I feel like uh, I could really use all of your experience so I don't have to, you know, <laughs> how right. can you save us all from, from making, you know, mistakes and stuff and just get us on the right path? I'm going to call out Ian Williams here <laughs> because he's been general manager of the Salt Lake Scots for 20 years. Yeah. I, uh, I actually had a conversation with Ian last week because an issue popped up in our group that I wasn't quite sure how to address. And I wanted some input from another band to know what they do in similar situations. So Ian and I talked for about, about an hour and he talked me through some of the ways that he 
build contracts and get to negotiations and just some of the things that he's learned over the years with Salt Lake Scots. I am taking note. Ian Williams is the next person I'll be interviewing. <laughs> yeah, be right. Oh, Ian's phenomenal. Interview. I want to know all his secrets. Please, and then you can write the book. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, so no, that's the the general manager part has been great because it's allowed me to get to know so many people in our pipe band. Like we have almost 80, 90 people oh, yeah, in that's Wasatch the, that's District. That's the crazy thing about Wasatch. Like anybody, I think in most other bands, honestly, maybe even around the world, like not just locally, it, it's a bit mind boggling to us to imagine that there are people in your organization whom you might have never met. Just right. because Wasatch is so large that it has multiple practice locations and things like that. It, it's a big, it's a big uh, thing. It's a big thing. And with that come some very real challenges. Like, oh, I'd imagine, if, yeah. If you're sitting in the grade four group, right? We have a grade right right now. We have a two, a four, and a five. We had our three. We ended up folding our grade three last year, mostly because of numbers. We just needed more more people at that level. So eventually, we'll bring that grade three back. It's just going to take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like it's it's challenging in this organization where we have this grade two band that is one of the only grade two bands in our region. And so because of that, this group has some unique comp com like competition challenges. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. they, they have to travel. They have to go and do other things. Uh, and then we, we have the most experienced pipers and the most experienced drummers in the organization that play with this grade two group. That means that the pipers and drummers that play in grade two most of them have responsibilities in other areas of the organization as well. Mm, yeah. So they feel like they're giving a lot to these other areas. Well, then we get a group like grade four and they see the grade two traveling to, uh, you know, like Alma, Michigan or up to Portland, Oregon last year. Or potentially the world's right. Right. Or like last year we were planning on going up to Maxville in Canada. And then you've got this grade four group and they're going, well, we want to do that too. Like we also wear those expenses. We also want to travel. Yeah. We we also want to do these things. We're tired of doing parades. <laughs> right. And absolutely, they should be doing all of those things. And then we have to balance a budget. Right. It and then, it comes and then we've got our grade five group who typically doesn't travel out of state. And we really want our grade five group to be able to travel out of state. So yeah, there's there's challenges there. And then we like... It's very important to me that our grade five group and our grade four group feel supported by our grade two group. Like mm, I, yeah. I want to make sure they know that we, we care about them, not just as people, but also as musicians and that we want them to grow and develop. And we want to help them with that process. Yeah, um, you, don't and, want, you don't want grade two to turn into like an ivory tower situation where like they like all the untouchables have now moved to grade two and they have no time for the peasants as it were you want that is you want exactly like, what we want to yeah, avoid yeah. right yeah. and so it just means that there's some extra time that that goes into things and it's a constant conversation with our committees to like all right well what what can we do to help these groups how do we help them develop what um you know just looking for spitballing ideas right and yeah. so there's a couple that have come up recently that I'm really excited to um, talk to committees about and see if we can get implemented. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, like your your own experience with uh, Enumclaw, where where that the old the old fire under the bum was lit. Like, if you can get a grade five player to an event like that, you know, it could be one of the best things for their development. But then you have the challenge of how do you move such a large group of people across the country? You know, um, exactly. that becomes very difficult. And so you don't you also don't want to hold grade two in within the borders of Utah because. Well, for one thing, there's nobody for them to compete with at present. And also, you want to have somebody going out into the world and, and you know, sort of bringing back these experiences and these these connections with other bands and great players and stuff like that. And, well, I don't well, envy your position. That it, it sounds like it is a difficult thing to, to balance for sure. Thanks. I want to say one thing on that. I think that process of going out and getting those experiences is so important. Like, I, I truly believe one of the reasons Wasatch has been as successful as they have is because Ross and Justin took the opportunity to go and play with a grade one band with some excellent players, and then they brought that experience back to Wasatch, and they've been able to 
implement what they learned playing with that grade one organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that would, I mean, even just the Utah piping community, if more people did that, took the opportunity to go out and play with a higher graded band, especially mm -hmm. at that grade one level, learn from them, bring it back and implement it in their organizations, I think that would help to continue to increase the piping and drumming in Utah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm with you, and I mean, I get excited for the for the sort of sort of uh, non-standard stuff too. I'd love it if we had more people going to play for a year with a, you know, a band in Brittany or 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 go play Gaita in Spain for a while or something. You know, and bring some right. of that stuff. Yep, back all of that is community. so helpful. It's it's uh it's funny to think about like the 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 device of the the hero's journey, right? And that's that's part of it. The idea of the hero's journey being that a person sort of starts in their village and then they they go out and have these experiences. And part of the hero's journey arc is to then return to the village and bring back what they've what they've gathered from their adventure. And of course, when we as individuals think about the hero's journey, we always think of ourselves as the hero. Um, it's not at all bad for me to sit here and think I am a villager, you know, in this regard, you know, in terms of like bagpipe experience and stuff, I personally am definitely a villager and that's okay because it breaks down a barrier where like, if I wasn't thinking that way, then there might be some hostility to learning from someone like Ross or, 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 or Justin who had gone elsewhere. I'm not saying that there is hostility, but I can imagine that there could be there, right. if I was thinking to myself, well, I'm also a hero. And so now there's some kind of competition. If I can instead be like, no, I'm a villager. Give me everything you got out there. You know, if I can be curious and interested, then uh, we can all gain from these experiences. And that's a great thing, not just for the band, but like you say, for our whole piping community. Yeah, exactly. I could not agree with that more. Well, Carrie Ann, I tell me if I'm reading this wrong, but I feel like I'm detecting something of a pattern in your life um, that is like, um, I'm trying to think how to sum it up. Something like there are seasons of life and sometimes you put the pipes down and that's okay. That has definitely been a pattern for me. I, I think it's 100% okay to take that time and to put pipes down for a little bit if you need to. But if I'm being completely honest, I definitely regret putting the pipes down in college and not picking them up for three years. Because I think that those three years are so crucial in the development of a piper, just that age that you're in. Mm, mm. And so I feel like there's there's this growth, like this, it's not growth that I missed out on. It was more of an, an opportunity for growth that I did not take. And so because of that, it's taking me a little bit longer now to experience the same growth that I could have experienced earlier in my life. Mm, mm. Um, but I also think that, you know, you grow as much as you're willing to put into it. Mm -hmm. So for me right now, <laughs> I don't, I don't pipe. I don't feel like I pipe as a hobby. Um, I feel like I have a job to pay for piping, but yeah. <laughs> piping is what I do. <laughs> I can relate to that. Like my, my job is my side job. Piping is my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, that that might change someday. There might be a time where I, you know, something requires me to take a little bit of a step back. And, yeah, that is absolutely okay because those pipes are always going to be right there just waiting for me to pick them up again. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's important. You know, I, 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 I we've probably all heard sort of the stories that are probably a bit exaggerated of, of you know, very accomplished pipers who would go to uh, see Gordon Duncan play in person and then go home and just throw their pipes in the fire. Right. Like like this. I it's like that's th those stories, of course, are intended as well-deserved praise of Gordon Duncan. Um, but I, I think it's probably a larger sort of human experience that you we might kind of look at the, the, the greats, whether it's locally or in the past or, you know, recording greats or, you know, uh, just the best soloist we heard one day at the at the games. And we might think to ourselves, well, if I'm not playing at that level, then what am I even doing this for? You know, and it doesn't have to be a world of absolutes. And, and, no, and, and, it and doesn't. It, in a similar way, like, I feel like I know a lot of people, and I've seen in my own life, where, like, I also I also started playing when I was a teenager. And it's, like, it's, it's pretty easy to play when you're a kid living at your parents' house and stuff like that. But then came a time when I really didn't have much time to play. And, like, because I had to put my pipes down, I experienced quite a bit of, like, sort of guilt as a result thinking like i'm i'm not living up to what i could be doing with the pipes right now you know like i should be 
and I had friends who were still practicing a lot and still playing a lot and really improving a lot. And so I felt like I was being left behind. And then came another period of my life when like work was good and stuff. So I picked the pipes up again and I could start playing again. It was really fun. But then, you know, my job changed or something like that, or we had another kid or something. And it, like, then there's another year or two where I could hardly play at all. And again, I had this guilt and I start feeling like, again, there's this like expectation of absolutes that existed in my head where it was like, either I'm a piper and that means I pipe a lot or I'm not a piper and I might as well just sell them, you know? And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, there are seasons to life and, you know, for a while I can be just kind of show up to practice when I can and, and play with a, a lower grade band and that's okay. And for a while I can be on like an executive board and for a while I can't do anything with pipes and for a while it's just a solo thing. And then for a while you can dedicate more time to be in a, in a higher grade band. You, you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, I think it's also important that we recognize the different classifications among pipers. Like, uh, someone who, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do a metaphor here. If we look at someone like Stuart Little, right? Mm -hmm, Stuart mm -hmm. is a full-time musician. That's what mm -hmm. he does for his life. Yeah. I will never have the same amount of time to devote to piping that Stuart does. Right, right. And because of that, I am i don't have this idea in my mind that I am going to be the same level of piper that Stuart is. That's thats not my goal. Now, mm. there's, there's a little bit of difference here, right? I would love to get there. Oh, yeah. So I'm yeah. still working towards that. I'm, I'm working towards that every single day, but I'm not expecting myself to ever get to that level. I am expecting myself to continue to improve, but I'm improving based on me. Like, mm. I want to be better today than I was six months ago. Yeah. And I want to be better in six months than I am today. But I don't. I don't need to be as good in – five years as Stuart is today. I just yeah. want to be better in five years than I was five years ago. Yeah, there's a, there's an interesting tension at play there where like it's useful to have these basically these heroes that you look up to and aspire to be like them. But also it's like aspire to be that way, but don't expect to be that way. So that, right. that way you don't end up like disappointing yourself and then getting into a cycle of depression and 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 failure and stuff like that. Um, and I feel like there's maybe a similar tension in like the way that like you talked about in your own story, how you received that email from Justin, right? And it was like, you kind of didn't want to get back into it, but y it was like that little prod pushed you back into it. And right. again, there's this tension where if we let, if we say yes to everything and get let every single prod from the, from our, from our pipe band or from other pipe bands, et cetera, kind of push us into accepting another role, doing another thing, et cetera, it can burn us out and destroy it us. Can. Absolutely. But you don't want to say absolutely no to any of that because sometimes that's what you need to like kind of do it, dig a little deeper and that's where you find more satisfaction. So there's like this tension between being able to put your pipes down when you need to for a year or for two years or for three years, whatever needs to happen or adjust how much you're dedicated to it. But also being open to saying yes to, to some of these invitations, whether they're direct invitations or otherwise. Right. And I think it's, it's also interesting for me when I've thought about the times that I've put my pipes down and then I've picked my pipes back up. Anytime my pipes are down, I remember how much I loved being in a pipe band mm. and how much I loved competing. But I also remember how much time it took from me mm -hmm. and how much I can do now that I'm not devoting that time to that. So for me, it's really, it's easy to forget how much I loved pipe band. Mm. And that's what can make it a little bit harder to pick those pipes back up. But once, once like in, in my past at least, once I have picked those pipes up again, so quickly I remember, oh, this is why I love this. I love the community. I love the family. I love the competition. I love making music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. It, it's, it, it makes me think, like we talk a lot about work-life balance, right? Like there's, there's something to be said for right. bagpipe life balance as well. <laughs> there is. And the balance is, is neither, you know, ignoring personal relationships and your health, et cetera, to dedicate all things to bagpipes, nor is it um, burning your bagpipes. <laughs> exactly. And hey, if there's anyone out there who wants to throw their bagpipes in the fire, they can just drop them off on my front porch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'll give you 20 bucks for them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, now, Karen, you, you did mention um, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned Young Legolas. I, I am vaguely aware of you recently doing some social media posting around the works of Tolkien. And I, I don't know if it matters much that for me, 
everything in my entire life. Uh, like Tolkien is basically my philosophy, religion, and lifeblood. And so it, it, his work means so much to me. I'm curious, what, what's going on with Tolkien with you right now? Were you rewatching the movies or were you diving into the books? What was going on there? I was watching the movies. So in high school, that friend uh, who, who had that big crush, she were, like we watched Lord of the Rings so many times that I, I hated them. I, I didn't, I didn't want to watch the movies, but she loved them. And she, we had to watch the extended versions every single oh, time. Oh, there's no and, other way. Right. And I know that now, but at the time I wanted nothing to do with Lord of the Rings. I, I was so sick of the movies. I probably tuned them out more than anything else. Did she ever make you watch the extended cut with the actor commentary, then the costumer commentary, then the, yes, (laughs) we had to do all of that. So (laughs) the last time I watched Lord of the Rings was probably in 2005 when we were still friends and before I graduated high school. And then after that, I was like, no dice. I'm never watching this again. It, it had grown stale like Lembus on a three-week journey, three weeks <laughs> oh into the gosh. journey to Mordor, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just like that. So I don't know what it was. Uh, I think it was like come on, maybe a month or two ago. It's probably because I just saw them on whatever streaming app I was using and thought, well, I haven't watched it in a while. Maybe yeah. maybe I'll watch it again and I'll actually pay attention this time. Mm-hmm. And my goodness, these movies are incredible. Oh. Like I <laughs> was crying so hard at the end and they're just it's yeah. so beautifully well done. Yeah. So I haven't I haven't read uh the books before. I really want to. I just need to get the time for it. Yeah. Um yeah. So I think however, I probably feel a about Harry Potter the way you feel about Lord of the Rings. Understandable, understandable, perfectly understandable, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And it, it just, it makes me smile so much to know that you found, you, you rediscovered a love for them when you returned to them. Because I do feel like that's, that's, the, that's, a, that's one of the many markers of a really good story. And I'd include Harry Potter in there as well, you know, like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, um, pretty much anything about King Arthur, stuff like that, where you can, if you can come back to it at a different phase of life and find like, renewed deeper love yeah then man it's good now i have to put a caveat in there though because with harry potter the books are incredible i can't stand the movies oh but the books are incredible (laughs) yeah my wife and i have often said that you know that we give the movies a pass because we love the books so much yes kind of very much that (laughs) i've got a i've got a nine-year-old son right now who is so into harry potter he uh has learned many spells i 3d printed him a, a wand he um he 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 does Harry Potter Lego reviews for us like at the kitchen table in the evenings. Okay, and, that's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun. <laughs> now, now what about other stuff? So now we've covered bagpiping and Lord of the Rings. Is there anything else that kind of takes up your time and energy and focus? Um at the moment, my sister and I bought a house in 2018 in Bountiful. I honestly felt a little bit crazy when we bought this house because I wanted to move to Bountiful because of the pipe band, uh, yeah. because I was out here all the time. Yeah. She wanted to be out here because of work. So we bought a house that was built in 1961, and mm. we've been uh, working on renovating it. We finished the basement and put a basement apartment down there. So I live in the basement. She lives upstairs. So that's definitely taken up some time. Um, and then just honestly, beyond that, work and bagpipes. But I'm doing... I feel like I'm doing more with bagpipes now than I ever have before because mm. I've got, you know, I've got the grade two band. I've got uh, the general manager stuff that I'm doing and the development stuff that I'm doing. I really want to learn how to construct a medley. So I'm working with some friends on uh, building out a medley. I have a keyboard. I'm taking some music theory classes because oh, cool. it's not something I was familiar with before. So I'm learning all the different keys and um, structures and how to like how to write harmonies. Um, I'm now composing tunes just a little bit. I wrote my second one yesterday and I was really excited about oh, it. Oh, awesome. Um, and then I've, I created a, an all girls pipe and drum group to go out oh, and play yeah, like I bar heard gigs. about that. Tell me something about that. What are you calling it? The Kilty Pleasures. Nice. I like that. Yeah. It was a, a name that Bethia Rue came up with pleasures. that, oh my gosh, we love. So I guess it's, uh, she was listening to Modern Family. Uh, or watching Modern Family, there's an episode in Modern Family where he uses the term "kilty pleasure." And we're like, "Oh, <laughs> that's cute. Let's do that." That is so great, the kilty pleasures. <laughs> yeah, and I'm hoping this will become a a group of women who can play together, but from 
from different bands. Like right now, it's mostly Wasatch people and then one person from Utah Pipe Band. Yeah. And I would love to grow it and see a, a diverse group of people from like different pipe bands in Utah. But I, I posted on some woman in pipe bands page on Facebook and just said, hey, we created this group and did this thing on St. Patrick's Day this year and it was so fun. And there were a couple people who responded and was like, hey, we'd be really interested in doing that in California. You should Ooh. franchise this. You should make this more of a thing. And and then just, have like an annual Kilty Pleasure meetup yeah. and stuff like that. Oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> My brain has been going nonstop since then. Like imagine if we had this, this Kilty Pleasures group, whether it's nationwide or worldwide, we have a logo and we've got like you know people can have their shirts for kilty pleasures yeah and there's these small pockets of female pipers and drummers getting together in different areas of the world to go out and do like private gigs wow, outside yeah. of their pipe band that, that and that is one of my favorite things like i'm also just like lit up by this idea that it would exist outside of the confines of any one band so it could build this this interband relationship and stuff as right. well Yes. Now, and this is probably a bigger conversation than I mean, I'm certainly not equipped to have it. But like, to what degree do you feel like a thing like this is needed in this world of bagpiping where like, I know, like, I'm a straight white guy with facial hair. So when people hire a bagpiper, I'm exactly what they plan to see show up. But I know that other folks like I know, I know some gals who play pipes who have shown up to gigs and had people be rather disappointed that they were not an old man with a mustache. <laughs> right. Like, so that's part of the uniform, apparently, you know, <laughs> a, a, apparently, you know, the, the mustache and the male anatomy. Yeah, exactly. So there's definitely been gigs where I've shown up to them and there seems like there's a mild disappointment until they hear me play. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that goes away. Um, I think it's, yeah, it turns out it's you actually don't need male anatomy to make the to play a function. bad fight. <laughs> so. Right. I think we, we tend to think about the general public and think that, oh, well, they don't know what a good bagpipe or a bad bagpipe is. So I can just go out and play and they won't notice the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's not been my experience when I go out and do gigs. They yeah. know the difference between a great bagpiper and a mediocre bagpiper. Mm -hmm. And so even though I show up and I'm not the the old man they were expecting on the pipes, I start playing and they go, oh, you can play. Yeah. They so go, oh, this, this is, is fine. <laughs> right. But what that means is that I, I feel like as a woman, I have to be able to play at a higher standard mm, yeah. to be accepted by people where a man could play at a lower standard and be accepted. You know, can you, I mean, you can see it so clearly, right? Like if an older white guy with a mustache wearing like a doublet and feather bonnet and pleat, you know, like the full, the full regalia showed up to a gig and played really terribly. Would anyone complain? Maybe not. Whereas if you showed up, especially if you weren't wearing, if you were in like a vest and belt instead of the feather bonnet, you full know, regalia, yep. and, and if you played not just like only okay, people would probably complain, right? Like it's more likely that complaints would come from that. So yeah, like it's like you have to prove yourself. Right. It mm. very much feels that mm. way. And then I, I recently um, had an experience where I felt like my gender uh, was a little bit attacked. Mm. And it was, it was in the pipe band world. Um, and I reached out to a group of women who... I've never met before, but they're a group of women in the pipe band world um, and didn't necessarily tell them what had happened, but just like reached out to them for a little bit of support. And James, the support that came back was incredible. Mm. And I think that that side is something that's needed because we are in this patriarchal society. And like, yes, there are women in pipe bands and it's, it's growing and it's getting so much better but we're still in the minority. We're very much in the minority. Mm -hmm. And the things that are, you know, even even from like the uniform that we wear and the way the uniform is designed, it's not designed for women. Right. Which is it's kind of funny because, of course, there's a kilt. Right. You know, but but you're absolutely right. Like if you put on a doublet or something like that, like, no, the, the, like the women, even the button down shirt. It, right. Absolutely. Like the and, and a tie. You got to wear a right. tie with it. Right. So it's like the women in the pipe band world must step into masculine things like clothing and stuff in order to participate. Correct. And because we're playing with men who tend to be 
um, a little bit more critical, a little bit less emotional. Mm -hmm. There are certain aspects of masculinity that we accept when we choose to play in a pipe band. But then there are other areas that we don't accept that are sometimes thrust upon us. Mm -hmm. And that's when things get really hard and it's helpful to have a group of women that can help support you through those times. Mm. So I think that something like the Kilty Pleasures, where yeah. we can have women supporting women, could be really beneficial. It sounds really cool. Sounds Thanks. really cool. I I also I like I I've just been thinking right now just about how like our comp, our bagpipe competition world is so born from such a, a military tradition, you know, um, and so much of the music as well. And I wonder, like, some of the critiques that you sometimes hear from even from within you know the bagpiping community is just that like you know the msr is getting kind of stale you know and uh I, I don't know to what degree this is a fair critique but i just i just wonder like if we if there was more of a legacy of women writing music would we have different kinds of music at this point you know that would kind of open up the open up some possibilities you know i just imagine something like a very regimental straightforward march compared to a very um moving and sort of emotional um uh, uh lament or something like that which of course men can write uh you know beautiful emotional music and, and women can write uh, military marches as well but i just wonder if we have a an over an over representation of certain types of music that might also be affected by by precisely this sort of patriarchal divide in the in the bagpiping world that is such a good question and it's absolutely something that's going to be on my mind now as i look at music and composers mm. Well, yeah. I feel scared that I'm going to say something wrong and, and, and get in trouble now. So uh, tell me how you feel about pineapple on pizza, Carrie Ann. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like roasted pineapple on pizza. Okay, okay. <laughs> you ever, you, do you like roasted pineapple in general? Like you go to Tucano's and get some of that roasted po pineapple? Yeah, I definitely like roasted pineapple in general. Yeah. I know I like roasted pineapple on pizza because Mod Pizza had this, uh, I don't know, it was like a year and a half ago. They had a, a Hawaiian pizza, but they used like, roasted pineapple instead mm. of raw pineapple and yeah. it was so much better than any hawaiian pizza i'd ever had it kind of gets rid of that sort of fibrous crunchiness from it huh it does and it also helps to get rid of a little bit of the acidity yeah. now oh, do you have any favorite pipers or bagpiping groups to listen to like recreationally uh i mean the i think the top two for everyone are probably Field Marshall Montgomery and Simon Fraser, uh, definitely in Verarian District. Their story is just incredible to me. Um, beyond that, I love like solo pipers. I love listening to Callum Beaumont, mm. um, Alistair Lee, Stuart Little, uh, Finley Johnston. I I don't know that I have very many piping groups that aren't like formal pipe bands sure, that sure. I listen to regularly. Mostly it's it's pipe bands and specific pipe band albums that I love going to listen to. I'm doing a lot more listening <laughs> to pipe music now that I'm working on learning how to construct a medley right. and trying to find <laughs> tunes that I like. So are you trying to suggest that there's more to constructing a medley than just like taking three or four tunes that you played when you were in high school and slapping them together in a different order? Yes, and I'm putting you on hold for one second. My mom just got here, and I have to go unlock the door for her. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Hang on. Yes, <laughs> there is <laughs> definitely more to constructing a medley than just throwing stuff together. Mm. Hang on. I'm still going to put you on hold while my yeah, of course. dog drags her leash across the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Problem. So I'm actually taking lessons from Stuart Little right now, and Are I you? mentioned Ooh. I am. He's a fantastic instructor. He better be. Right. I think I had I had uh, a couple of lessons with another um, open player in Scotland, and I left those lessons feeling so discouraged every mm. single time. Like, was I ever going to measure up? Was I ever going to be enough? And then one lesson with Stuart, and I left feeling like, I'm going to be the best piper in the world. I'm a kick butt <laughs> piper already. I'm amazing. Awesome. <laughs> it's like Stuart just does a great job with building confidence. Yeah. Uh, but I told him that I wanted to work on medley construction. And he said that in Inverary, when they first start looking at medley construction, they'll get together with the, the whatever group they have that, that does their medleys. Um, they'll go over to the College of Piping and pull out all the books <laughs> for when they look through music. Mm. But they also talk about gimmicks first. Like, 
uh, we want to reprise the jig as a waltz at the end. Ah, we want yes. to have a bridge from this tune to this tune. We want to um, modulate as we go from this key to this key. We want to play a fast jig and then we want to slow down the jig and then bridge it over to the straps bay. Like mm. um, they'll talk about gimmicks that they want to do first. And then they start looking at music that fit the gimmicks that they came up with. Um, he also mentioned having a lot of contrast in your medley and you can change the, you can add that contrast in with changing the keys with playing faster and sl slower with the drums playing louder and softer um, I swear there was something else that he mentioned, but just having lots of contrast in your medley, but then yes, making sure that the music fits together. So one of the things I learned that I really like is what I mentioned earlier, reprising a jig as a waltz at the end of the tune. Mm -hmm. I, I, I also, love that. Yeah, I also love that. When I hear any kind of reprisal at all in a set, I think it's just wonderful. Return to the beginning kind of thing. I'm with you. Yep. So that, and then I'm working on uh, harmonies, trying to figure out how to write those. But yeah, I think there's definitely more that goes into a medley than grabbing some music and just putting it together. That, it is interesting. You mentioned that, that variety is important in a medley, which makes sense to me. But like, you know, I've, I've put together a couple of medleys here and there, really not knowing what I was doing, you know. And often it feels like there, I, I, I at least felt like there was kind of a pressure to make a lot of things sound the same you know like very similar yeah. yeah yeah make like make sure your march your strass band your reel are all in d or it's going to sound weird when you transition from one to the other right so one of the things Stuart mentioned is that if you have like let's say you're going from a jig to a jig right you're putting two jigs next to each other mm -hmm. and you don't change the key in the second jig many audience members who are unfamiliar with music and for with pipe music and even some of those who are familiar with pipe music will think that you're in the same tune. Yeah, you're just like, oh, it's a, this is an eight-part jig. Wow, it keeps going. Right. So if you're staying in the same time signature, you need to change the key. Hmm. But if you're, if you're changing time signatures, then you don't necessarily have to change the key, but it just kind of depends on what the music is and what it looks like. So as I've been listening to more albums, I'll... I will try to figure out, all right, where's where's the break here between tune A and tune B? Mm. And if there's a key change, it's very easy to figure it out. But one of the tunes I was listening to, they did a jig, and then they reprised that jig as a waltz immediately following the jig. And it took me a minute to go, oh, we're in a different tune now. Mm. It sounds the same, but it's a different tune. Mm. So I don't know, it's just been interesting as I'm trying to pick that out. That is interesting. So so you are taking these lessons. You're learning some music theory. You have been playing harmonies with Wasatch for a while. So you're digging into that some more. Have you done anything with um, learning uh, fundamentals on percussion, on snare, bass, or tenor? No, I have wanted to for so long. But yeah. every single time that I decide, like, okay, I'm going to start taking tenor lessons or I'm going to start learning snare, I, I just double down on my efforts on the bagpipe yeah. and then I don't have time to do those other things. So I've, I've learned a little bit with like tenor flourishing, mm -hmm. but not with the rhythmic side of it. And I have like an intro book for snare stuff and I can, I can do some very simple rudiments. Like I can do some flams and some paradiddles and, um, a very beginner role, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's about as far as I've gotten. Gotcha. Gotcha. I just w I would imagine that that's kind of the next piece to to fit into where you become like this this I mean you're writing tunes as well like you're you're becoming this um this uh master of all the elements where you can be like what you need a you need a a set I will write all the tunes and the harmonies and I the can do it. yep I can do all of it <laughs> it's definitely the goal hmm. that's a, that is so cool now um you have. You're one of the, and I don't mean this to sound creepy at all, but like um, when someone has a nice set of bagpipes, people hear about it, you know. Do, do, are you one of the folks that has a set of Athertons? I am. James, can I tell you about my bagpipes? I was hoping you would. <laughs> I love them so much. Okay, so back in 2011 is when I started looking to purchase my own set of pipes. And I, I searched high and low, listened to so many music samples, and I decided then that I wanted a set of Atherton McDougal's. That that was the goal. And eventually I got on his list. The pipes 
the pipes I picked out at the time were like silver everything, engraved everything, yeah, yeah. most expensive everything. I'll use a student loan to pay for it. <laughs> really bad idea. Uh, but I got on his list of like he had like a year long waiting list. Six months into it, I saw someone post that he had gone into an early retirement. Hmm. And so I emailed him and turns out he was not actually going to make the pipes that I was on the list for him oh, to make. No. So very last minute, I scrambled. I ended up buying some Wallace pipes from Scotland. And like they they worked really well for a long time. Yeah. Then back in 20, this was, it was 2017. It was my first year, like first competition season with Wasatch. Justin Howland mentioned something about someone's playing a new set of Atherton's. And I was like, new set? Is he making bagpipes again? Mm. Um, or maybe he mentioned someone was selling Atherton's. That's what it was. Someone was selling Atherton's and he mm. knew I was interested in it. So he sent me the link. It was Yori Chisholm was selling them for a student. I asked Yori where the student got them. And that's where I found out that Dave had just made them, but the student couldn't, have, you know, it was in a weird financial position and didn't, couldn't afford them anymore. So he mm -hmm. was helping the student to sell the pipes. So then I reached out to Dave and I said, all right, Dave, here's the deal. You were going to make me pipes. You went into an early retirement. It sounds like you're back. I really want you to make me a set of pipes, but I want something a little bit more unique than what you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. So initially I asked for completely plain turned pipes. I didn't want any combing or beading on them. And I did not want white uh, projecting mounts. Mm, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't love the te tuxedo look. I wanted something else. So I asked for Coco Bolo and he refuses to work with Coco Bolo. Apparently turning that is awful. Interesting. So he recommended Bloodwood or Pink Ivory. So he got some samples of both. He turned them both and decided that Pink Ivory was gonna be a better fit. And I was like, all right. I'll go with it. I think it's beautiful. Let's do the pink ivory. And then um, I, during this time, I kept looking up so many bagpipes and I found a set of McClellans that I really liked that had, they, they were almost plain turned, but there were just a little bit of combing on them. And so I sent these to Dave and I told him, you know, I think these are gorgeous. Could we do something like that? And he said, yeah. Were what these, if we just... Were these McClellans the ones that have that kind of bowling pin look on the ex on the yes. outer profile? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yes. Um, so he just, he said, why don't we do some, some delicate lines in the middle of each piece and mm. kind of sent me an example of what he was thinking. And I was like, yeah, I think that is beautiful. Let's do that. And honestly, I was shocked all along the way that Dave was willing to make this instrument so unique for me because I had heard that like, oh, well, Dave doesn't do that. Dave only does this. Dave only, he he has a very specific thing that he does and he won't do anything else. Like so he's a all, superstar. He, you, right. you do what he says. Exactly. That's yeah. what I had heard. So all along the way when he was like, okay, you, you want to do something unique here? Let's do it. Let's make this mm. change. Let's try this thing. And I was anyway floored that he was willing to do it and so grateful and anyway, I, I was very anxious <laughs> to, to see what they were going to look like. Um, I had picked out the engraving pattern. It was the Victoria stipled pattern from David Davidsey up in Canada um, that I just thought was, I don't know, just kind of like a, a very classic but beautiful engraving. And then I got the first picture from Dave when he had finished one piece of it and he sent it to me and like, oh, James, I almost cried. Like they were <laughs> so pretty. And I love how unique they are. So the, the pink, pink ivory for, I'm sure a lot of people are not familiar with it, but it is a wood out mm -hmm. of Africa. It is um, protected the same way that African blackwood is protected. Uh, I guess in, you know, hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago, pink ivory was only used for like royalty in Africa for mm -hmm. very specific tribe leaders. And so it's, it's a little bit more common now than it used to be, but it, the heartwood starts out as this very striking pink color. And over time from exposure to air and exposure to the sun, it either lightens to a tan. If it's, if it's not the heartwood, if it's more of the outside of the wood, it'll lighten to more of a tan color. Mm -hmm. But if it's that really pink heartwood, it darkens to like a dark red. Mm. So now my projecting mounts have this dark red color on them and i i love them and i ended up not going with the mcdougall sound i went with uh his premier model which is kind of it's a for me it's a bit of a mix of his mcdougall and legacy 
Um, but I thought that it, they would be great for solos and they would also be great for band work. In the future, I would love to purchase a set of his McDougals. I just, um, I just need to win the lottery first. Yeah, that's, that's the thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your second set of Atherton's. You think you have a band set and a solo set, right? Yeah. So, so are you telling me that pink ivory is actually uh, red wood? Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, and so if, if money were no object, would, would, uh, would another set of Atherton's sort of be your first thing or would you do yes. something else? I would definitely get another set of Atherton's mm -hmm. and go with McDougal's. You know, I, I like that kind of plain turned look as well. Um, I, a lot of the pipes that Ross makes have that kind of plain turned look to them. And I like that a lot. Me too. My, mine I are love beaded it. and combed and stuff. And I love them. I love my pipes as well. But, you know, I think it's very pretty. So I love the plain turned look because I, with my Wallaces that I had, I realized that from a distance, my pipes almost looked plastic because mm. you can't, you can't see like the grain in the wood sure, yeah, yeah. with all of that design on the wood. So that's why I wanted it to be a bit more plain turned so I could see the beauty in the wood. Mm. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I do love a good wood grain. That's one of my favorite things for sure. Very pretty. Me too. Um, do you play small pipes of any kind? I don't. Uh, if I had the lottery again, <laughs> I would yeah. definitely buy a set of small pipes. Um, I, I would want to start with mouth blown small pipes because, so Ross let me play a set of his small pipes, his bellows blown small pipes at one point and, and like, make your eyes cross. Oh my gosh. There is a <laughs> learning curve. <laughs> <It's> weird, <huh? laughs> yeah. I think those are great. If you want to be able to talk while you're playing or sing while you're playing, or if you really just don't want to have to worry about moisture getting on your reeds, right, then right. those are fantastic. Yeah. But um, I think I would start with mouth blown small pipes. Yeah. That makes sense. The The first time I played Bella's Bowl and Small Pipes, uh, Zach, you, you, you remember, I'm sure you knew Zach Lees, right? I did. Uh, he brought a set over to my house and he and Diana were in our living room and I strapped him on and started playing and, <laughs> and my eyes were wide. I felt like a little <laughs> kid learning how to ride a bike and they just started laughing and Diana was like, that's exactly what Zach did too. You know, it's like, yep. it's like, you, it's like you, you, am I doing it? Am I doing it? <laughs> yeah. They, there's a big learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's funny. Now, now, right now, who is it that most often gets to hear you practicing? Um, honestly, no one. <laughs> yeah. During the winter, I practice at a local church building because if I practice inside my house, it will cause contention with me and my sister, and I love <laughs> her to too much. the peace, huh? Yes. <laughs> so and I practice this, over at the church. Is this the same sister that you moved to Arizona to be near? No, that one's my younger sister. I live with my older sister. Gotcha. So you, but you like them both, huh? I do. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, and who would you say is your personal biggest fan? My grandma, but she died a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But she was, as I was learning piping, she was definitely my champion. Yeah. And I and I don't I don't mean to to pry anything that's painful. I'm sorry to hear that she passed. Nope, but you're good. did you happen to play pipes at her funeral, or was it a situation? I where did. It did uh, it was the first time that I did a public performance on my own, and I literally cried through the whole. The whole way through Amazing Grace, yeah. um, I learned then that crying while playing a bagpipe is very challenging. Very. I've had to repeat that a few more times. Yeah. So I've done better in the future when I've cried while piping. But that, that one was hard. Yeah, I can imagine it would be. I mean, I've, I've been in a couple of those situations where a loved one passes away and you're asked to pipe and you have to say like, no, I, I'll hire someone else to play, but I won't be able to. So right. I'm impressed that you, that you made it through anyway. And that's kind of special that it was your first sort of public performance by yourself. And it, you know, it's it got that her. sort of, yeah, that is special. Yep. To, to kind of bring it to sort of a gentle, uh, a gentle landing here. Um, first of all, is there anything else that you would like to say? I'm really grateful that you're doing these podcasts, honestly. That's it. Fan my um, ego a bit. That's the best thing to finish with. <laughs> well, okay. So I, I had a competition in San Diego, California a few years ago that uh, I had a work conference the week before the competition. And so I stayed for an extra few days. And uh, one of the gals from Blandford said that they were having a band barbecue that night and invited me to go since I was, you know, in California. I, I had another gal from the band who was there with me, but it was really just us. So I went over to this barbecue expecting it to be a Blandford barbecue. Mm -hmm. And there were people from four different pipe bands there. Mm, yeah. And I was shocked that that's a thing that people do because I couldn't imagine ever doing that in Utah. It's been kind of tribal, hasn't it? 
Yeah. So when I came back from that, I was pretty determined. First of all, I felt like there wasn't that maybe there is a bad perception of Wasatch out there. Just from a couple people I've talked to, like I know that there was bad blood with Utah and Wasatch back in 2004 when things split. Yeah, and I know that's that there's hard. right. And like I know sometimes things have been really challenging since then. So I really wanted to work on that public perception, but I also really wanted to work on relationships between Wasatch and other pipe bands mm-hmm. so we could get to the point that like having a multi-band barbecue was a thing that we could do. Yeah. And I've been so grateful to see just little changes that have happened since I did that competition in San Diego that make it seem more and more likely that we could do something like that in Utah. Mm. So well, I, I am with you on that vision. And I know, and part of my drive is that that's exactly what Zach wanted. Zach wanted very much to kind of improve the band to band relations locally. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely feel like it's improving. And I think this podcast is going to help that as long as people listen. So, well, I'm going to leave that in there because um, I'm hoping that anybody hearing it, it will help them to feel motivated to let me interview them because for some folks it's a bit intimidating. But the thing is, the, the point of it is let's all get on here and get to know each other more. So, Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, now, as I fade out, I'm going to have some drones come in and stuff. Could you give us a piece of advice for a piper or drummer when they're getting ready to do a gig? What kinds of things do you do to get ready? And we'll finish with this. I show up maybe 10 minutes before I need to be there. I'll sit in my car for a little bit and mentally go through my checklist of items or the tunes that I'm going to play. I'll finger through, again, the tune that I'm going to play. And then I get my pipes out. I tune them up. I never expect my tuning to be perfect. Just good enough. That seems smart. Yep. And then when I'm ready to go, I will go and talk to a few people at the event before I start playing because talking to others, engaging in conversation helps to take away my nerves.